apparently not a carotid artery, but she had a bleeding disorder, and the puncturing was made not under ultrasound, and, and this was then a major legal problem for the doctor who performed uh, uh, the procedure. There are many implant sites for the central catheter. Uh, we will mainly focus on the internal jugular vein, and I will discuss this uh, in detail. But also, of course, we have uh, femoral vein, there's some clinical vein, when there are no other options for AV access, so that's the only time when we consider the subclavian vein. And uh, of course, uh, alternative implant sites which may be more challenging, uh, uh, like the inferior vena cava. So, considering that there are several uh, sites, which is the best one? Uh, these are a summary of the 2006 uh, uh, KDOKI guideline. As you probably know, Dr. Locke, who is part of the faculty here, is uh, the chief uh, uh, and coordinator of the new guidelines that will come out in 2017. So maybe this will change, but uh, so far the point is that long-term catheters should not be placed at the same time of the metering the AV axis. We should avoid the femoral catheters in patients who are candidates to kidney transplant. And the preferred insertion site is the internal jugular vein, the right internal jugular vein. So this is what the guidelines say. Recently, in non-dialysis patients, I want to show you this uh, um, paper because uh, it has been uh, uh, discussed a lot and it came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, of course, very prestigious um, work. But this was done not on dialysis patients, but it is important because it's a randomized control trial of three sites and evaluating intravascular complication. So what was evaluated were mechanical complication in gray, uh, vein thrombosis in uh, yellow, and uh, bloodstream infections in uh, uh, in red, and you see that the subclavian jugular and femoral sites at different uh, rates. Uh, quite surprisingly, actually, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, thrombosis was more common in the jugular, uh, more in the femoral, a little less in the jugular, and the least uh, thrombosis in uh, uh, subclavian, and also infection was lower in. Uh, Subclavian than in uh, internal jugular vein, while uh, mechanical complication, which is probably related to the fact that the catheter has to grow through the through the clavicle and the first uh, ring, are higher in the subclavian. Uh, absolute number is about three percent. You see three percent of complication, so not very high in uh, in this uh, series of uh, about eight hundred patients for each group. So the conclusion of the trial uh, were that uh, uh, the subclavian vein catheterization is associated with a lower risk of bloodstream infection and symptomatic thrombosis compared to femoral and internal jugular, although there was a higher risk of uh, pneumothorax, which is understandable, of course. So the point is, do the results of this randomized control trial apply to dialysis? And there was a, a, a comment, editorial comment in Kidney International regarding this uh, um, article. Uh, and the title, as you can see, is We Still Go for the Jugulars. And uh, the, main, the key uh, sentence in this uh, editorial comment was that the lower risk of acute complications with subclavian catheters must be weighed against the higher risk of central venostenosis in patients with chronic kidney disease who are expected to require dialysis in the future. So the point is, again, if we have a perspective of uh, constructing, of creating an AV access in the arm, then we should avoid the subclavian. But I think that this study will tell us that if there is no more option on the uh, on the arm, then maybe the subclavian can be used. So 
let's now shortly address the anatomy uh, uh, of the neck, just focus on uh, catheter insertion and uh, so in dialysis we use very rarely the subclavian veins so we will concentrate on the jugular veins this is the right internal jugular and the left internal jugular and then you have the brachiocephalic vein what is very important here is that left and right are not the same they are very very different and the other point that I want to point out from this anatomy um, drawing cartoon is that the pericardium, the upper pericardium, as see, is right here. So if you have a perforation here in the vena cava, then you will have pericardial uh, effusion. So don't assume that if you have a problem in the superior vena cava, you will not have pericardial tamponade. It can happen if it is below the pericardium. So you, we usually uh, perform uh, uh, placement of catheter with ultrasound. I think most of you, no, actually all of you will know that the preferred probe is a high frequency linear probe because it is ideal for superficial structure. This is a real um, cut of, an, uh, of a neck. You see that there was a frozen sample. And here you have the sternocleidomyestoid muscle and the carotid artery, the jugular artery, so the vagus nerve. And I want to show you now the anatomy when we look at the patient with ultrasound. This is the artery. This is the internal jugular vein. This is the trachea, the tighter gland, which is close to the artery. And the muscle is also on the superficial part. And here is the vagus nerve. So this is a very nice picture that uh, can tell you exactly what you have around the vein that you are, are trying to puncture. It's a very important uh, tip is to do a preliminary evaluation of the neck vessels because uh, you can identify positional anatomic variants of thrombose veins. And uh, you know only about uh, 26% of the cases have the vein which is lateral to the uh, carotid artery, while 62% is partially um, over the, um, the artery, and in 11% of cases it's even more medial than the artery. So this underlines the fact that it's very important to have uh, ultrasound guidance. Another important point during the preliminary evaluation is to check for thrombosis and you can do just simply by doing compression of the vein. And if uh, it can be compressed, then it is patent. This is a case of thrombosis, so after compression you don't see any change. This is another case when you have um, on the left side the carotid artery, which is lateral, and the, medial, and the ve and jugular vein, which is medial, and it's also a small vein, so this is a very difficult procedure to perform. And now, um, regarding ultrasound uh, uh, guidance, this is the old times, anatomy landmarks. We don't use this anymore. And there are two approaches. One is going with a short axis of the vein out of plane and you will just see the needle tip which might not even the needle tip uh, might be the needle itself while if you go in plane you look at uh, the needle that can go into the uh, directly into the vein this is a longitudinal uh, axis but you can also have with a short axis, you see that with the short axis the vein is a circle in plane by coming lateral into the vein. So you have a perfect view here of the needle getting into the internal jugular vein. So we publish this approach, the lateral in plane technique. And, uh, and this gives you an example. This is the out of plane approach. 
and this is the in-plane approach. So in this way the needle will be under the ultrasound beam. It's very important to work for tunnel catheters and even for temporary catheters with a sterile environment. And uh, if you want to see a, a video on puncture the vein, you can find it on YouTube. And uh, I have it here, but uh, I will just show you a few seconds because of uh, problems with time. See, there is an evaluation of the, of the vein, and you can see at the same time the position of the probe. And then if we go a little farther here, then this is the compression that was done to verify the presence of a patent vein. And farther on, you see the needle here, which is close to the vein. And now this is the time when uh, uh, the, the needle gets into the vein. It's a very nice video that you can uh, look at in the internet. And if you want to see something even more detailed, there is a video from the New England Journal of Medicine, but this lasts 18 minutes, so it's very detailed and very nice to see. So, what we have, considering imaging beyond the ultrasound guidance, in addition to ultrasound, I suggest to have an ACG monitor on the patient during the procedure because this will detect guide wire induced arrhythmias and of course for tunnel catheters I also suggest fluoroscopy I know that not everybody has the possibility to have fluoroscopy on the right in internal jugular vein you can do it without fluoroscopy uh, on the left side I do not recommend to put a catheter without fluoroscopy because uh, there are uh, more possibility of uh, problems and complications. This is just to show, you the, to show you the anatomy of the heart. Just there are drawings here. When you look at the ch chest x-ray or during fluoroscopy, this is the right atrium in uh, white, the right ventricle in red, the left ventricle here, and the... Um, uh, left atrium so and this is the aorta and the superior vena cava and the pulmonary artery so just keep in mind when you look at the heart uh, where you are especially when a guide wire goes around uh, considering the insertion of catheters in the left uh, brachiocephalic vein you have to consider that there are two angles here and uh, you should be very careful in using dilators uh, and the p level introducer from the left side. And because not only you have two angles here, but uh, if you look at these images, <clears throat> the aortic arch, and this is the sternum, you see it will go in front and then back. And, uh, and, and this is the coronal view, the regular coronal view with the two angles, but uh, you see sometimes it's a very tortuous and uh, if you push with the dilator you can uh, damage and perforate the vein. This is another image of the aortic arch and this is uh, the left side so if you have a dilator or a catheter inside here you should go in front close to the sternum and then back into the brachiocephalic vein. Um, that's another video, I don't have time to show it to you, but uh, uh, if you uh, want to look, take a look at that, uh, I can, uh, re regarding the insertion, I can, I can show it to you or give it to you. Uh, something about the tip position, uh, there is a consensus that for tunnel catheters it should be in the right atrium. The problem is, where is the right atrium? So just a few suggestions on how to locate uh, you have to consider the, um, this angle here. The length of the superior vena cava is something between 5 and 7 centimeters. And then you have here the length of the brachiocephalic vein, also 7 centimeters. 
So if you want to get into the right atrium, you, you should consider that you have at least 14 centimeters here, plus the, the, the space in the internal jugular vein, and, and therefore uh, you should choose the correct length. So I was telling you that the right tracheobronchial angle is very uh, interesting as a reference because it's easily recognizable. The top of the cutter should be in the at atrium, and this is about five to seven centimeters from the right uh, uh, tracheobronchial angle. Using a, a catheter with symmetric tip will help in putting the catheter in the right position because the functional length is shorter compared to other catheters. So with a split catheter, usually you have two tips, not one tip to consider. But in this case, you have a shorter tip. One other important point is using antegrade or retrograde tunneling. So the point is, this is a typical retrograde tunneling. First you put the catheter and then you assemble, after tunneling, the external part. So why I suggest to, do, to use the retrograde tunneling? There are four reasons. One is that it facilitates a faster and more precise catheter tip positioning in the right atrium, it helps to create a smooth tunnel tract, minimizing catheter kinking. And the decision on exit site location after the tip positioning allows an easier cuff positioning. Because of course, if first you put the, the tunnel and then you, you insert the catheter, it might be more difficult. And then of course, if you have to replace the external part, it's easier because you can disconnect it. So a few images of catheter kinking, this is uh, enlarged, you see, this catheter will not work even in the procedures uh, room. So you have to try and see that there is a good flow, because if there is not a good flow, you should look for this. This is the same catheter that was uh, removed. And this is another smaller but clinically significant uh, kinking. In this case, probably one of the two lines will work fine, which is the external one, but this one will not be able to give you enough blood for dialysis, or it will give you increased resistance if you use it as a, uh, a return. While this is a lateral approach, if you take the exit site more lateral, you will have a nicer uh, a curve and less probability of kinking, like in this case. So how to avoid the, uh, bleeding after procedure, if you had that experience, uh, you had a good procedure, then the patients go to, back to the, uh, his own bed and uh, the nurses will call you, the patient is bleeding. The point is that you should not use high concentration heparin at the end of the procedure, because part of this lock will get into the circulation. So you can use 4% citrate or a solution with diluted heparin. I usually do this about 20 to 30% in saline. Sometimes we have cuff extrusions. If you, you can avoid this by squeezing uh, the cuff before uh, uh, insertion. So my time is uh, up. I want to remember that uh, uh, the Journal of Vascular Access is a dedicated journal to this field, and I'm available to, to see your work if you would like to submit to our journal. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, it's over to the chairpersons for the next five minutes for discussion. So thank you, sir. That was a wonderful talk. Now, if we could have some questions from the floor about the tips or tricks for catheter insertion. Good morning. Uh, the three-site study which you said, uh, by convention we were thought, uh, always taught that the, the femoral will have a higher risk of infection than the jugular. Why was this difference there in the study? Any idea on that? Well, uh, the, the, uh, we, maybe we can, no, we cannot go back to the figure. The point is that it's easy to understand that the femoral uh, will have a higher infection because of the location close to the genitals and, uh, and uh, probably the subclavian compared to the internal jugular has lower infection. The, the puncturing site was higher 
So the movement of the neck probably has more uh, problem with the dressing compared to a subclavian where the dressing is well fixed. So that's my interpretation. And that, but I want to suggest that this cannot be applied to dialysis patients. I think we need a randomized control study in dialysis patients to have uh, the real situation. I wanted to ask you one question. Like, do you face any difficulty when we do uh, left-sided cannulation? Uh, there is sometimes a huge difficulty that the tip of the catheter, you have to keep on changing when the flow comes. You know, in like three to five percent of the patients, you keep on placing the catheter, you know, uh, you know, you have to find a very one centimeter or two centimeter area in the uh, right atrium, then only the flow comes. Otherwise, you keep on positioning the catheter, the flow will not come. You know, what does it happen? Well, uh, if you have the tip in the right atrium and you don't have flow, uh, I think that the only possibility is that your catheter has been put through a previous uh, uh, catheter maybe mm -hmm. and you are inside the fibrin sheet. Mm -hmm. Otherwise if you are in the right atrium it's impossible that you don't have flow because we have five liters per minute in there. You know I, that's why you know this this is a problem because we do around two catheters a day and we face this problem like maybe once a month and you keep on adjusting the catheter side and it's not it's like a new punctures uh, it's not like in a fibrin sheet but you keep on adjusting the catheter, sometimes you have to go into the upper part of the IVC, the ticket long catheter, 20 centimeters, mm. to get the flows in, and you play it in the right I atrium. Don't know. I don't know the answer, but okay. I'm not sure that the problem is the right atrium. Maybe okay. it, w it is the position in the, uh, because as I show you, the left side is very complicated. Yeah. It's even more complicated than, le than left subclavian. Yeah. To yeah. me, they are the same. Uh, having a left internal jugular and a left subclavian is the same because the brachiocephalic vein is occupied by the catheter yeah, sure. and uh, with, a, with, with that kind of tortoise uh, uh, path. So maybe the problem can be a kinking mm -hmm. uh, in the path rather than uh, over there. And maybe sure. when you move it, the kinking is, is changing. Sure. So you should maybe look more closely to the to the first part rather than right atrium. The other possibility, you have thrombosis. So yeah. if you do a CT scan, you see thrombosis in the atrium, then it's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, do you advocate the use of, uh, uh, you know, guide wire, change over a guide wire, especially for recent catheters which are malfunctioning, not because of infective complications? Yes, we, we, do, we do change uh, catheters over guide wire because uh, our philosophy is not to abandon a vein if possible. Uh, and so we do that routinely. What we do usually to have a nicer um, procedure, uh, we cut the skin over the clavicle and we isolate the catheter there rather than putting the, the guide wire through the, the catheter at the exit site. Uh, and this is a much cleaner uh, procedure because you don't have to put the, the guide wire through the exit par part. Also what we do usually, we isolate the catheter, we cut the catheter, we uh, clamp the catheter, and then with the needle we puncture the we puncture the catheter itself, so that this will avoid air embolism. You will lower the risk of air embolism, because otherwise, if you have a big catheter and you cut it and you have to put a guide wire, that's a little uh, tricky. So uh, the other point is that you can, in, during that maneuver, you can put the patient in a Trendelenburg position. Maybe some blood will come out, but no air will, will get in. So either you do that or you close, you clamp the catheter and then with a needle, like doing uh, the procedure from the very beginning, you puncture the catheter and you put the, the, the guide wire through the needle. Yeah, I'm sorry for the interruption, Madam Chairman. We'll have to move on to the next presentation. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Dr.